What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of RX Bars. Uh, they end up selling to Kellogg for $600 million. Check out that interview. This is before I even know, honestly, Jim, how big they were at all and how they built that up. Um, P90X uh, founder Tony Horton talked about how he made money as a street mime uh, before he sold hundreds of millions of dollars. He actually, that's how he made food in apartment money he was a, he put his head on the street and was a street mime at the time uh atari founder nolan bushnell talked about how when steve jobs he was steve jobs's mentor that steve offered him 33 percent of apple for fifty thousand dollars and why he said no and you'll appreciate this one jim uh i talked to noah elper who you know, started uh noah's bagels and yeah. later einstein bagels and he told me he started out selling religious tchotchkes out of his trunk that was not a you know super successful business and yeah. then he wanted to sell bagels so that was super right. interesting and um today's episode is brought to you by rise 25 which i co-founded with my business partner john corcoran our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers um and we do that through a done for you service we do a done for you podcast service to help you connect your best clients and uh partners um and we also do a done for you event solution where we'll go and partner with companies and do a VIP event for them. Um, and it's behind a greater mission and purpose. Um, you can go to rise25.com slash mission and it's a veteran entrepreneur scholarship. So when we do events, we try and actually uh, fund a veteran entrepreneur to come so they can meet the network and help up level their business. And it, there's a long story behind that. It's my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor in Nazi Germany, while John's grandfather was a B-17 captain pilot who flew 35 missions over Nazi Germany. And we really want to support just entrepreneurs and, and veterans. So go to rise25.com slash mission, apply, and or if you know of someone, tell them about that link. Today, I'm super excited. We have Jim McCarthy. Talk about events. Like This guy is the veteran uh, of events um, and spreading the word on events so people can actually go to them and find them. Um, Jim McCarthy is a co-founder and CEO of Gold Star, and Gold Star started in 2002, which in internet years, Jim is like you know, 300 years old and, um, (laughs) uh, they sell millions of live event tickets to millions of people on behalf of more than 5,000 venues and producers every year. Um, he's a curator and co-founder of the TEDx Broadway. He is on the board of directors for the union station, homeless services, as well as the Pasadena playhouse. And you have to check out sellingout.com. Make sure to find Jim's podcast, um, on there on sellingout.com. And also, don't mess with Jim because I read Jim. I don't know. You're a black belt in Northern Eagle Claw Kung Fu. Just yes, that name right. scares me. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it should. It really should. It's it a means like in less than three seconds, you could probably kill me. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It might, it might take ten. 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 Okay, got it. You, you seem tough. Thank you for joining me, though. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. This is great. You know what's interesting about. I love reading some of those stories because what's interesting about entrepreneurship is almost all the time what you start off doing is is never what you end up doing in the company or the product. It always evolves. And you have a really interesting eclectic background from studying English at Harvard, MBA at UCLA, teaching English in Japan, experience with Nose Bagels, GeoCities, on yeah. to Gold Star. Yeah. I wanted to hear a little bit, start off with the Nose ba- some Nose Bagels stories and what you learned there. What were you doing at Noah's Noah's Bagels? Yeah, Noah's was really a formative experience for me. And I I consider myself very lucky to have been there at that time. You were talking about Noah, who the first thing I tell people is there was a real guy named Noah, and he was the founder of Noah's Bagels. And I I worked with him. I knew him very well. I still occasionally hear from him. But uh, this guy was the mensch of menches. You know, and, and it really is uh, 
you know, he, here I am, this uh, Irish Italian guy, um, using Yiddish terms and you know, knowing the ins and outs of Love kosher it. and everything else. It was really, you know, it was re- it was one of those kinds of experiences. But the in in the early '90s in the Bay Area, the hottest concept in the in the whole place was Noah's Bagels. We uh, we had a relatively few stores. <laughs> But you might wait at the marina, for example, the marina location for an hour, hour and a half really? to get your bagel. And it was a big celebrity sighting place. It was really bringing not only like a pretty darn good bagel and a, and a true kosher keeping um, shop where you could get, you know, lox and schmear and, and whitefish and all the things that typically are pretty hard to find getting in California. Here. Yeah. Yeah. But it was also the thing that Noah always talked about which is this idea of hamishakite which is this warm homey feeling that people got when they went into a noah's store Mm. and we very successfully with his sort of strategic direction and guidance we created a really special uh concept a really special place um and then when i joined as a store manager in one of the berkeley stores we had if i'm not mistaken 13 locations entirely in the bay area And over the course of the next three years, we had 150 locations uh, up and down the West Coast. Uh, And so that was a story of, you know, incredible, you know, things that you learn about how how, what growth does and both positive and negative and really pushing an organization to its its sort of breaking point in a lot of ways. And, And some things went well and other things broke. You know, and, yeah. and so that that sort of story about what does it mean to grow an organization really, really fast, and you know where where do things start to go awry, um, and where do things what can you replicate easily and what can't you? That that was an amazing part of it, and underlying all of this was a an extremely healthy uh, employee and customer centered culture um, that eventually changed <laughs> you know so it was a really an object lesson in brilliant brilliant things and and noah and his brother dan certainly laid the foundation of that the early employees uh, but but also you know where those things are not invulnerable you know the however found firm the foundation might be they're not invulnerable to decay and 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 you know the vagaries of what happens when you you put other pressures on them. Yeah, that was big. big yeah, learnings. you experienced growth growth firsthand there. That's tremendous yeah. growth. Yeah. And you know anything, right? If you want to grow muscle, it has to break. You know, it has to tear yeah. the muscle fibers. So you have to, you know, it has to break down to grow. I imagine. Yeah. Um, what are some? What did you see as some of those? And you probably brought those into Gold Star too. What are some of those? The growth that? What were the positives? What were some of the the negatives that? Yeah, you saw with growth. Yeah, the, I think the, you know, the positives relate to the firmness of the foundation, and that is a commitment to delivering something for a customer and doing certain kinds of things correctly. Mm. Um, and it also so, and that relates not just to the product or the service, but also how how people interact with you as a customer, how how employees interact. I think one of the the biggest things at Noah's was that uh, the the kind of contract if you will between the employees and the company was very positive and very strong Mm. and that allowed us to navigate some pretty rough waters but but then on the on the negative side we we went so far with that stress that even that wasn't enough to kind of hold um, some aspects of the business together you know years ago in business school I did this case study mapping Starbucks growth against against Noah's growth mm. and you know some of the commitments that that got made at different times and this was actually after Noah had had exited the business but the you know that's the, interesting the, from your perspective experiencing yeah. that I imagine other people in your your MBA program had not you know didn't have the the insight or inside knowledge of it uh, pr- probably not yeah. you know and if you graph the start the growth in Starbucks stores and just a few, they were around the same time as Noah's, and on different scale. But the percentage growth was actually was act, was actually quite steady. Mm. The number of stores was tremendous because they were just a bigger organization. But the growth in terms of the percentage was it was actually fairly steady. The growth at Noah's on the base was just straight up. 
Hmm. So it was just straight up. So it was the, the two lines actually tracked along together for a number of years, and then and then ours went straight up, and theirs continued to, to sort of on that steady climb. And uh, it reached a point where you you know one of the biggest problems when you you face growth of that kind yeah. is that you cannot, especially if your culture or if your business relies on people who can operate inside a culture that's you know uh, that's that's reinforcing a culture that's you know supportive all of that is you can't find enough people who can get committed to that fast enough. Mm. What was the argument in the MBA? Like when people were saying, would they say they should have tried to grow slower or that they, they, if yeah. they had the chance to grow, they should just grow? What, what are your thoughts and what was the conversation around that? I think I was pretty persuasive on the fact that we grew too fast on the base, right? I think yeah. what, what Starbucks did that enabled them to sustain the, the larger numbers is they allowed the base to grow at a at a steady rate for a number of years. Yeah. They, they got into the game before Noah's, so they had a sort of six or seven year head start. And so that rate of growth continued until the base was large. Um, you know, like I said, we started with 13 store. Well, I, I started there when there were 13 stores and just, you know, a year later they were 50 or 60. So you're talking about you know, whatever, 400% growth on the base. Mm-hmm. That is a lot because, you know, if, if you have 13 stores and you open five, what happens is you can take the expertise of one store manager or one, you know, set of trainers and you can kind of graft those onto the new, you know, the new plants. Mm-hmm. Um, but at some point, you just run out of the yeah. people who, who can bring that to, to the party. Yeah. So uh, it was really a, a, a wonderful and sort of unfortunate sort of winding down. Yeah. That, that with, with Noah's. You seem, you know, it's interesting, Jim, you're sort of a natural teacher. If you go back on YouTube, you have these great videos from like nine years ago of teaching right, like right, business right. concepts. Um, I want to go back to your Harvard days for a second. Sure. Um, and I, you went to go on, you went on to teach English in Japan, right? But at that yeah. point, what did you want to do? You're, like, you're at Harvard. What, what, yeah. What are you thinking you want to do when you grow up at that point? You know, when I was, in school, yeah, I think there was a point where I thought maybe I'd I'd be an English professor. Hmm. Uh, but the more I got acquainted with what that meant, the less I wanted to do it. Why? <laughs> just you know the the sort of uh, English department politics just seemed really pointless to me. And and um, I love uh, I love literature as so many do. And the joy of of literature can just be smashed right out of you after a certain amount of sort of academic you know, exposure. <laughs> I was like some people. That's why you go to Gold Star and you go to you know <laughs> the right. theater and experience exactly. it entertained, right? So, exactly. That, yeah. That's right. That's really more the idea. No, I mean you know there's 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 great you know academic work that's done, but on the other hand, a lot of it's like oh god, you know, I, I read this because I I liked it, not because you know I wanted to, to break it down it to the to degree that degree. Yeah. Yeah, so but you're I, thinking I, English you professor, what then what? Yeah. Say, say again? She so said, so you, okay, English professor, you're like, okay, cross that off. What? Not for me. Yeah. Not for me. I mean, but here's the thing that, that I would, I still say that, uh, especially in places where they do a good job in the departments, a degree like English or history or, or geography, or there's so many disciplines where what they're really teaching you is critical thinking and communication skills. Right. And I think that um, you know the the brilliant thing about my degree, although you know part of it was yeah I read a lot of great literature, which has its own set of benefits in terms of learning what it means to be a human being. But in disguise, it was a profound course in critical thinking and communication mm-hmm. because we were we were held to very rigorous standards as it relates to what did we think, how could we demonstrate. With, with a with a support base that you could say this is why I think that over a sustained you know eight ten fifteen twenty pages about something fairly sophisticated right so the I I really do think that whether you're talking about history or you know literature or, or fields like that there's a tremendous amount to be gained from that as opposed to you know simply going to college and saying I'm going to build a practical skill. Mm-hmm. I mean, here's one way I think about this. When I was in college, the job that I ended up doing or the field that I ended up being in did not exist. Right. So, that you know, there's very little in the way of foresight 
<laughs> that I could have had to right. prepare myself. I'm doing air quotes that you can't see right. uh, to prepare myself for you know you know running e-commerce companies because it didn't exist, right? So, and that 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 wasn't just true then. That's going to continue to be true. Totally. What um, I want to go on the internet days and, and talk about GeoCities in a second, but yeah. I, I really want to hear your favorite top um, business book, leadership, marketing, could be whatever. And then outside of business, because yeah. I'm sure you are, you're vastly, you read a vast amount of different things throughout the years. What would you say some of the top business, marketing, leadership, whatever you like, what are some recommendations when people ask you? Yeah, th this is a good one because um, the, the, the first thing I, I say is that, you know, most business books should be articles. Hmm. This is my experience. Hmm. You know, most business, book, most business books really should be like a really compact, well-written 15-page article, right? But there's no way to sell a 15-page article. So, um, but th there's some great ones. There's one that I read, um, there's one that I read uh, about a year and a half, two years ago that it doesn't sound like it would be a business book, but I actually think it is. There's actually two, one of which is um, is whose title I recall right now. The other one I might have to look up real quick because they're both really great. Yeah. One is called The Inner Game of Tennis. Oh. And it, it is about tennis. Uh, and that's the the sort of disguise that it's wearing. Okay. Um, but it's about, really, it's about how to get performance from yourself in any circumstance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it talks about... Um, S1 and S2 being the the very conscious part of your brain and then the, the part of the part of your brain that actually has already internalized a lot of things and when you have to deliberately move away from that you know always on narrative mind and move into the other one yeah I thought it was absolutely a profound book um, there's another book who if you want to pause I can look up the title no real you quick. go ahead look it up we yeah, don't have to pause yeah as you if you're looking it up I'm going to talk for a second because yeah. I hope it's on Audible because I love Audible. I probably listen to four to six books a week. And one of my favorite books of all time is Wooden. But you'll appreciate this. You said John Wooden. Yeah. Any of John Wooden's books, honestly. But Wooden, you know, if you're watching the video, I have it like on hand. Like I could reach for it. And I have right. all these notes. I've like torn through it. It's And like you're talking about a 15-page book. This is... This book is like very small pages. You can get through it in like yeah. no yeah. time, and it's just got life lessons, business lessons, whatever it is. So this yeah. is this is one of my favorites. I uh, yeah. Well, everyone loves John Wooden here, obviously. Y yes. Um, <laughs> God bless him. So what's anyways? I don't know if you find uh, the other book. The other book, I, and I really just cannot recommend this book strongly enough: mm -hmm. Leadership and Self Deception. Hmm. Uh, it's a it's a book about the consequences of. Uh, failing to fully see other people as human beings um, and the self-deception that arises from that and then the mm. faults of leadership that come from it. And wow. I, I just think it's really great. And the other one that I would say specifically for entrepreneurs, and I'm, and I'm focusing on ones that are relatively new because I think um, the other ones have, you know, people have heard of, you know, Carnegie and, and things yeah, like that. Carnegie, yeah, exactly. um, is Was written by... Um, by um, uh, Horowitz, the the VC. Oh yeah, uh, uh, how to, the hard things about hard things. The hard, the hard thing about hard things. Yes, yes. And this book was the most real entrepreneurship book that I've ever read. Mm. Um, you know, I, I I think that he is is you know spilling some tea there about entrepreneurship that is so often overlooked in a yeah. world where entrepreneurship is kind of glorified. glorified. Yeah, well, glorified and. People just talk about the successes. They don't. Yeah. It, the, the successes get glorified. The, yeah. Those same stories we don't hear about Noah selling tchotchkes out of his trunk. That right. you know, religious tchotchkes that was a failed business. You hear about yeah. Einstein yeah. bagels. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So and I you totally don't hear about the the gut wrenching aspects of the successes. Yeah. Either. I, I think that's the other thing. Is like even when the and I think maybe especially when there's a success, there are moments where you just like don't know why you even went down this path. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go back to GeoCities, but you said when I was doing some of the research, and I love this, and I want to have you dig in more with this. You're like, what are you going to say, Jeremy? But um, you said, if you're not ready for two or three years of virtual misery, then yeah. don't start your company. Yeah, I understand. Um, 
<laughs> so, <HTML>. tell, <laughs> yeah. so tell me about some of the early challenges because that comes from I'm sure what you experienced with yeah with Gold yeah Star. I I think this goes back to that whole and I when I give in advice to entrepreneurs I tell them you know you you need to be ready for, yeah. for this um, because for most people uh, starting a company has to do with a lot of anxiety around your personal financial security. Hmm. The, I mean, if you happen to be independently wealthy or or whatever, the burden is perhaps lighter, you know. But for a lot of people, this is about putting your financial stability at risk. Um, and, and relationships sometimes too, because sure. the biggest fights become because of that that instability. That that's right. I I think in fact it spins out to, you know, just about everything in your life is destabilized by this. Um, and there's no guarantee that you're going to get something in return, financially, from that risk. There's no guarantee, you know, whatsoever. It's not just work hard, pay off. It just doesn't work yeah. that way. And so um, when people go into it and they don't know that that's what they're in for. And they they resist that. It's like you know the the GIs who've been to Iraq, you know, in, in Afghanistan have this expression: "Embrace the suck." You know, like once you're there, you got to get in the mindset like, "Yeah, this sucks." You know, we got a job to do, and we're gonna get through it together. That that kind of mindset. It it's obviously a far less intense form of that. But as an as an entrepreneur, you kind of have to embrace the suck because it's not gonna be easy and you know the more the more you're fighting against the fact that it's not easy or that it's not you know paying off i think the worst that you you're going to handle the the instability that comes from that um so I, you know I, I think that people should be very very you know straight in their minds about the fact that this is not going to be like an inspirational poster Right. You, you walk into the lobby of like a WeWork or someplace like that and they have the big neon sign on the wall that says, you know, the hustle never ends or, you know, so, something like that where you're supposed to go. Yeah. Look at all these, you know, hot shots that are just hustling all the time. And that's nice. But look, it isn't really about that. I mean, you that that's that's all fine, but it's a lot more. um potentially life deranging than than you think and you gotta you know you gotta know a know you're getting into that and b have the guts to not quit when that happens because if you quit when that happens you know the first couple of times you never should have started in the first place what did you experience early on i mean we didn't make any money we the those of us who started the company didn't make a dime from the company for at least two years hmm. so you know we all walked away from pretty good internet business salaries right to start a company and our only goal in the early days was to replicate our salaries with something that we were in control of right so that really was goal one was you know pay our bills that's most people uh, yeah it's like everyone it's great, actually yeah this is a very under uh this, this is a very undervalued goal in my opinion right because suppose you get to the point where you start a business and it pays your bills you are you've now created so much optionality for yourself, right? That that you can build on. And so, yeah. you know, that wasn't our our only goal in the end, but that was definitely the first goal. Yeah. And it was one of the most meaningful achievements that I, you know, have ever have ever had. Um, and it happened relatively early on, but there's still a period where, you know, and and by the way, if you're lucky, you get to that point. Yeah, if you totally. if you're not, you you don't, right? So, um that's that's just something that you know I remember feeling times like well yeah how am I going to pay my mortgage this month not sure you know yeah it's it's a it's due in a week and a half and I don't know how I'm going to pay it and so those are moments that are real gut checks for people you know totally uh, I feel like you see I see things online people um, I guess advertising their their course or whatever and it's like make whatever amount of money. And I'm thinking most people just want to make what their salary is and have control, have a certain yeah. amount of freedom, you know, of what they're doing. You know? I think you're right. I think control is at the core of, of most people's financial goals as opposed to Ferraris, you know. What did you have to do to keep going? Because obviously you had to pay the bills. Yeah. Um, yeah. What were some of the, I mean, you had to hustle 
in other ways. Yeah, uh, early yeah, on. we um, yeah we did um, projects, web strategy and development projects for different people um, over that couple of years. You know, yeah, um, it was um, it was very hard. I mean, you know, one of the things that was a very noble goal was when can we get to the point where we don't have to do that stuff anymore? You know what I mean? Um, it creates and, a hunger. It had to create a hun- literally a hunger yeah, to, to get and, to that next level, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, every day, the progress that we were making just felt like pure bliss because it was it was getting us closer to that point, you know? Mm-hmm. So no doubt about it. No I mean, even those, those famous, I think it was the Airbnb, right? They created the Obama O's or some kind of cereal early on yeah. or whatever. Yeah, so I, I love those stories like that. Um, talk about the evolution of Gold, you know, Gold Star itself uh, as a yeah. service, uh, what it started off as. And then obviously, you know, I just, just to, I went back through the onboarding process of Gold Star just to, mm-hmm. just to go through it. So I, I signed in for my Facebook account right. just so I can go through it and remember because I had signed up with my email. Um, and I suggest every, anyone go on Gold Star because it helps you find amazing things that are going on in your city and yeah. then add a large discount on top of it. Right. Um, but right. what I love about the onboarding piece, and I want to hear early on compared to now, is I go on, it makes sure that it's the right city. So it's like, hey, make is this the right city? And then I have to type in the zip. Very user-friendly. And then I have to go in and then actually, what days of the week? I wouldn't have thought of that, right? What days of the week do you like to go to events? And yeah. oh, that makes sense. They, they, these people probably know what they're doing. So that's why they're asking me these questions. Um, and then what activities do I like? And then beyond that, like since I'm in Chicago, what venues do I like? And so yeah. it kind of hit all the the things that I'm sure, you know, that's uh, split testing for 17 years to figure out what people actually want at the time. Yeah. And now it pops up. I have it on my right screen here, which is all the cool things that probably fit my needs. So early yeah. on, what did it look like? Yeah, it was uh, a lot simpler uh, 17 years ago. I, I would say that it's it's remarkably the same in concept, which which is a selection of events that it started just in Southern California, but um, gradually expanded geographically. We relied more heavily on email in those days, and obviously there were no real, there was really no mobile component to it. But uh, it it was roughly the same. We didn't have the benefit of we have a, a product called Matchmaker now, which is the AI that targets and selects the events that we think are going to be right for you, mm. which won an award earlier this year. It's awesome. Congrats. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And it's which, working good on good. my side for me. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, and the more we know about you, the, the better that works, but even with relatively little information, it can get some pretty, uh, some pretty amazing results because we can look deeper into the catalog and say, Hey, people that, that do this, have have enjoyed this and so mm-hmm. um we, none of that existed at the time there was a it was a much more I mean, what, was the, what was it like in the internet then i mean it's like this is yeah. early early on what did, what did it look yeah. like yeah at the time i i mean you know I, I still look back on the design it looks very much of its time but it looks good of its time it was uh it was organized into what what territory do you want to be in and you click on that and you get a sort of index of events um, and the event record, you know, that the title and the, and the price and that kind of stuff has changed stylistically a million times between now and then. I mean, that's part of it is that some of the change has been improvement toward, you know, better understanding of how things work. And others has just been changes in style, design. right? Things have, have really changed um, in terms of people's expectation of design. Every now and then you come across a site that hasn't changed in, you know, 10 or 15 years. Price list? But, oh. oh, well. Or ever, I don't think yeah. more like twenty five years, <laughs> yeah. um, and um, and you see like oh that's you know that that makes me think of two thousand five totally you know? yeah uh, so we you know we we've been through three or four iterations of ma- major change I mean mobile being the really the big one about seven or eight years ago where the user behavior was shifting so rapidly to mobile that we had to make a sustained, you know, two to three year investment in getting that right. That's both tough, on mobile right? Web. Yeah, very tough. Very tough. I mean, you have to uh, you have to overhaul the platform to make sure everything's totally. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say with mobile and and you know, this has happened primarily now, but there was a long period of time 
where organizations were dabbling in mobile, right? They were, they were saying, what can we do to, to tweak what we're doing? Or the way I used to put it was, you know, you think that the uh, desktop is Batman and mobile is Robin, but what you don't realize is that the mobile is Batman and the desktop is Robin. Mm. And there was a period of time where I was out there saying Batman and Robin are, are switching costumes and you got to take account of that. Um, well, that's good because if you, you know, if you didn't, you'd probably be like ten years business. behind the eight ball, right? I think we'd be out of business. Really? Right? Like, th- this is what this is what I, you know. Sometimes I talk about with with entrepreneurs or just internally is sometimes you have to make a commitment that you can't prove is going to work, right? Um, you can't demonstrate to yourself or anybody else how you're going to find your way through the dark forest yeah. or get to the top of the mountain. But you have to make that commitment because the stakes are survival. And so, you know, there, there's a whole thing, you know, in, in today's entrepreneurial environment about being data driven, which, of course, is very important. But there are some decisions where you, you, could, you could be data driven to prove to yourself that the audience is moving to mobile, for example, several years ago. But you can't prove why the ROI of what you're doing at any given time is going to pr- pay off because <laughs> – you don't know how to do the thing that you know you, you need to do. And I, I remember the day when I came into the management meeting and did a little table pounding in like 2010 or something. We have to be as at least as good on apps and mobile as we are on the desktop. I don't know how we're going to do yeah. that. It might take us a long time, but we have to do yeah. it. And that's because slightly, that's a slight, I mean, I don't know, slight, maybe it's a more, it's a controversial belief at that time too. Like there, there's not, yeah, yeah there's not, the data isn't there at that point, right? You're making yeah. a you're making a prediction off of your experience. Yes. Yeah. It was it was as if you were looking up at the at the snow covered mountain and the avalanche is moving, but it isn't threatening the village yet. <laughs> you know right, what I mean? Right. And I'm like, you know, I think that avalanche is gonna crush this village, so <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what? That that little thing? That's not gonna. That's not gonna. Well, it will be fine. We'll be fine. Like, nope, nope. The other people uh, around you get crushed, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, and there and there have been some companies, you know, roughly speaking, in our space that have, you know, really come undone, gone out of business, and one in particular that was extremely well funded around that same time that went out of business, and the day they went out of business, they didn't have an app. You know, and and so I'm sitting there going like, I'm not saying they went out of business because they didn't have an app. But what I can say is that they didn't make the investment in mobile mm. that that was necessary during that period of time. Right. Mm. So um, it it's, um, you know, those are the kinds of things that it's a it's a gut check moment. It's where the commitment has to come before the, the confidence that you can do it. You have mm. to say, we're doing it. You know, we're, we're doing it um, because we need to do it. It's either uh, survival stakes or an opportunity so big that we're going to have to figure out how to climb this mountain on the mountain. What's the equivalent now to, um, you know, desktop mobile? Yeah. The, what's now. the equivalent now for us or just in yeah, general? Yeah, for, for, uh, for you. For, yeah, for like, yeah, where are you looking? Yeah. Um, yeah, th- there's a few. Um, and... Let me think of one that that actually means something to your. We we started a line of business uh, about a year ago, where our venue partners and promoter partners can actually buy additional promotion on Gold Star via an interface. So it's almost like Google AdWords, except for in a native live entertainment audience environment. You can self serve. You can you know that has all this flexibility. And, uh, yeah, I think that line of business is enormous. I think there's basically no limit to the market, you know, market size there. But um, we, we went into that line of business knowing that in order to really, you know, get the value of that, we were going to have to figure – we were going to commit to it and figure it out as we go. So, fortunately, it's gone well. We have a product called Boost that's year-on-year growing, you know, 50 to 100 percent and is a – a real beachhead for us in, in this area and giving, you know, our promoter and venue partners more and more tools they can use to promote mm. their event on gold star, beyond gold star, all this other stuff. So we're committed That's to the great. idea that, yeah. So they're on your the platform idea. and this gives them the capability to get it out 
yeah. to other places and sell Absolutely. more using your platform. Yeah, so the commitment for us is that it's going to be uh, the one place where you can go if you have a live event and promote it in a million different ways. Yeah, that's great. And we're part of the way there. That but makes sense. It, yeah, the, it, it really does work. And there, you're reaching the Gold Star audience, but you're also reaching a bunch of other audiences now. You know, we have partnerships with places like Groupon and Yelp and Bands in Town and, you know, a bunch a bunch of others. Um, and so it, it's the kind that of makes, thing. That's for, smart. They'd rather you know, go off of your hard work of doing all this and like put, bring yeah. it into their system than do it themselves, I imagine. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we have the relationships with the venues that uh, allow us to get their attention for that. There's so many interesting questions. I, I want to hear your take on partnerships um, mm -hmm. from an internal perspective. It's, it's hard enough to run a company and it, I imagine having partners is amazing. And it could also be challenging. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. I want to hear your thoughts on partnerships from your co-founders because you started with a few people. And then partnerships because you guys have thousands and thousands, thousands of, of partners yeah. on the company standpoint. So yeah, how do you I, form partnerships? Your, yeah, your thoughts on partnerships. Maybe just start internally, your, your co-founders. Well, the, you know, the, I could talk all day about that. But, yeah. I mean, we, we've had uh, a, a, an incredibly productive relationship. We're friends um, in addition to having started the business. Um, and we we have some real alignment when it comes to values and objectives, but then we also had the benefit of being really different in terms of our skills. Um, mm. I think that was really the thing. We had similarity where we needed it and difference where we needed it. And so we were able to do a lot of things um, as a team early on that would have perhaps required us to spend a lot more money um, to find people who could do, I hear sometimes founders who I need a person who can sell or I need a person who can build, you know, and you can actually build the, and I feel, I feel like I was lucky to avoid those problems because with the three of us, we, we really, and, and the people that we could kind of rope in Tom Sawyer style to helping us in the early days. Right. Um, Paint you know, those we fence. Like, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? It's going to yeah. be really fun. <laughs> we, we took good care of all those people. Don't worry. Um, but, um, you know, we were able to get a long way. Uh, on that basis, um, what were think, what were the divisions like? What was your what's your superpower, and then what are your co-founders? Yeah, so so roughly speaking, um, the Rich Webster, who um, was one of the co-founders, handled everything related to the venue partnerships. You know, he, he built the relationships, figured out the processes. Um, Robert Graff, who uh, was still the CTO, was building the product. Uh, and that was not only the customer facing product, but also the uh, the partner facing part of the product, which has also been always been very important for us. Yeah. And then I was doing uh, everything that you might think of as marketing or communication, uh, including customer service. I was the customer service department for at least a year, mm. you know, um, which gave me a great grounding in, in the customer, by the way. But totally. um all the marketing campaigns, all the you know concepts about you know how to get the business off the ground from a marketing point of view, that was me. And so we sort of expanded from those three roles uh, as time went on. But yeah, that's how we got there. I love it. Um, partnerships from you guys have thousands of partners. Yeah. Um, talk about the early days, maybe reaching out to some of the. You said it was local, and now yeah. now what's that look like? I mean, you know, in, in some ways, the, the pitch is just the same, which is you can reach our audience um, and we make it really attractive. You know, in the early days, it was all about going to them with credibility, which we had because we had experience in the Internet business and e-commerce and a pitch that just spoke to their actual needs. Uh, our goal in the first phase of our development of this was it's got to be a, just a no brainer. It's, it's just got to be an obvious win for them. And this was a very fresh idea at the time. Now there's a lot more you know, places where you can have a third party sell for you. That wasn't the case mm. yeah, in 2002. Um, Did you and we just do a lot of vetting at the time? Like can, if someone decides they want to go on your platform or do you have to approve them? Um, well, at the time it was, mo it was us going out to people to, right. to pitch them on doing it. And now it's a very open system where someone could, literally someone could come in, create an event, the tickets go live, they could buy ads from us, um, and then we'd sell them, and all that would happen with no necessary intervention. But there's things in the background that say, like, is this real? Is it, you know, um, you know it, it's a relatively 
limited audience. There's there's probably a few thousand, few tens of thousands of people in the U.S. who are in the business of marketing shows, right? Um, professional shows. So it's pretty easy to know when someone's just not real. Um, right. They don't know, you know. I, I, most people couldn't get through the submission form of, you know, tell us the specifics of your event if they weren't actually in the business, you know. So yeah. it hasn't been a big problem. And over the years, we've tried to make it as easy as possible um, for people to get us their event content and get it live. And just this year, we launched. Uh, we've launched so many features successfully, but what it really adds up to is someone can go and create a fully digitally ticketed show, buy ads to it, sell it, whatever, all on their own. Um, mm. So it, it's really it's come amazing. Along. Yeah, it's it's really good. It's really good. Um, Jim, I always ask since it's Inspired Insider two things. First of all, thank you. Thanks for sharing all this. Oh, it's amazing. I love hearing the journey. It's really, it's inspiring to hear. Like when I read Shoe Dog. Um, I feel it was like kind of like therapy because yeah. hearing the hard times is, is therapeutic that like everyone goes through these things is not just, yeah. you know, me. So thank you for sharing all those things. Um, one, I always ask, um, what's been the lowest moment and how you push through? And then two, on the flip side, what's been some of the proud, what's been a proud moment for you? I, I think the lowest moments came early on where there was just, I didn't know how I was going to financially endure you know um and just meet just meet my responsibility well, kept you know? going though like because you you for you kept pushing you could have quit well i, I tell right? you that I'll, this is probably something that that entrepreneurs should know about too the lag between the success in your business and the financial rewards of that can sometimes be substantial right so the thing that kept me going was we were going well like the business was going do, 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 up 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 and so here I am going, this is working. But that doesn't mean that I'm You're pouring it back in the business. Money, is that what right? you mean? Like, yeah, there's a phase there's a phase where that's appropriate and there's a phase where it's not. Um, and if you start to drain the resources of the business while it's progressing to feed yourself, you're you're yeah. net net doing a disservice because you know, it's it's it needs those resources. It's like you you're know, getting the positive reinforcement, but not maybe experiencing the positive, re some, something like that. Yeah. The, well, the, the success of the business oftentimes runs out ahead of your own financial success. Um, but it's a very satisfying feeling. It's just that you got to take a deep breath and say, OK, how long is it going to take to get there? And what do we have to do? You know, and, and I think that entrepreneurs should know that that can happen, but also take care of yourself to some degree when that it gets to the point where you are at risk because you're not getting resources you have to take that into account right mm -hmm. like just as the business needs those resources to grow there comes a point where like if everyone's about to break on a personal level then we you need to you know the best investment you can make is directing those resources to the people who are going to make your business work on a day in and day out basis so i'm giving you permission as an entrepreneur to start taking money if that if it if it makes it possible for you to you know make the business work right like that is also an investment it's yeah. not purely selfish or or short sighted it, it is important um, but you know there were there were some tense there were some you know tense times and we pushed through them we didn't uh, go raise money and give ourselves salary you know it, it just wasn't that kind of that wasn't that kind of thing yeah. So that's when but, you, you know, studied Northern Eagle Claw to get out your Kung Fu to get out your um, <laughs> aggression. Aggression. I, <laughs> I, you know, I was actually a little bit later, but, but okay. the point is well made. Yeah. Well um, on the flip side, some proud moments for you. Oh, I, I mean, I just feel there's been millions, you know, um, we've had um, so many milestones either with products that we've rolled out or millionth customer, 10 millionth customer. Um, I'm trying to think of, of recently, I mean, I, I, for example, I mentioned getting to the state with our organizer facing tools where it is truly a self-serve platform and, and digitally integrated with the ticketing systems and everything else. We had a major release on that uh, just a few weeks ago where I'm just looking back in, in wonder at how far, that platform has come and how far ahead it is of anything else that's out there. Mm. And so, you know, there's, there's just a lot of things where, where, you know, when you look back from the perspective of where you are, it's, it's kind of amazing, but, um, 
you know, then again, there's there's a million more to come, right? So. Yeah, and there's there's a couple other you know contributions you can make now because of this. I imagine you're the TEDx Broadway co-founder, yes. and then the Union Station Homeless Services. I yeah, yeah. You, I don't know if you want to mention both of those and, and kind of what your involvement is. Well, TEDx Broadway is a TEDx event on Broadway, just like it sounds. Yeah. And uh, Gold Star has been in collaboration with Situation Interactive, Situation Marketing, I should say, which is a, a Broadway based but not exclusively Broadway marketing firm in New York. We've been co-producing this event for the last eight years and it is a, a great day. It's on September 24th this year at New World Stages in New York City, so people should come. Uh, we have great speakers both inside and outside the Broadway world that are there and we, we get to, you know, this is actually another relationship and partnership building opportunity too. Uh, it's been really fun and, and good. Um, Union Station Homeless Services, I've been on the board now for about almost six years mm. and it is an organization in Pasadena, California that is one of the most effective organizations in the whole country uh, when it comes to uh, reducing homelessness and actually you know working on the problem of homelessness and we re recently I'm very excited in the near future we're going to be talking about the goal of eliminating homelessness in Pasadena wow. by 20, 2025 um, since 2009, uh, Union Station has been part of reducing the homeless population of Pasadena by 50% at a time when in Southern California and beyond, homelessness has been increasing but wow. very fast. So Amazing. it can. Be, I think the message that I would have for people who aren't in Pasadena, aren't in Southern California, but anywhere in, in America and beyond is it's a problem that can be solved. Uh, I think there's a lot of sort of despair about homelessness. We don't, we don't have to have it. It's, it's uh, the way I put it, and, and I think entrepreneurs and business owners can resonate with this. The, what we've chosen as a society right now is a very expensive solution with very poor outcomes. Because homelessness as it currently exists is extremely expensive for us as a society to foot that bill. Um, so we've chosen a high price and poor outcome. The kinds of things that actually reduce homelessness are less expensive and give you an outcome that I think, you know, as sort of decent human beings, we, we don't want our fellow citizens living the way that, that people who are on the street live. And it's no good for anybody. You, yeah. know, we, you know, people should not be ashamed to say, you know, homelessness, you know, degrades the quality of life for everybody, most especially the homeless, but we can do better. That's really the message. Homelessness can be ended. Um, and it's, it's not even that complicated. There's, there's some really straightforward things. We, and there's a lot of will. There, there's been a couple of um, uh, things passed in Southern California, for example, that fund a lot more services for homeless, uh, homelessness prevention and abatement. It's because people care. They, they, don't, they don't want it to be this way, and I, I think it doesn't have to be this way. We, we don't have to have homelessness the way that we have it now. So, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I want to... Yeah. Jim, just be the first one to thank you. Everyone should check out goldstar.com yes. for any possible events you want to brain, you know, think about and go to in your city anywhere in the U.S. And sellingout.com. Where else should we point people towards? Those are great. I okay. think, you know, Gold Star, I'd say check Gold Star first. If you want to go out, that's, that's your first stop. Um, cool. Selling out is for people who are in the business of selling uh, and marketing live entertainment. And we talk to all kinds of folks that can share their perspective on how they've been successful uh, and beyond. So if you're in the biz, go to sellingout.com and Gold Star. If, uh, if you're not in the biz and you just want to uh, find out what's going on and save money, check Gold Star first, and I think you're going to be pretty happy. Cool. The app, website, it's all there. Thank you, Jim. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand